I'm here with Mark Randolph, who's the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix and the author of this great book, That Will Never Work. Thank you so much for being on the show, Mark. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So you come from a family of overachievers and pioneers. How did they influence you growing up? So one thing in my household, there was always this attitude of risk taking. I mean, to the point, I was an outdoors guy and I would come home, like one time I came home and told my dad, hey, I'm going caving. And rather than being one of those dads who were, what are you, nuts, you're crazy? It was always like, oh, that sounds great. So every junction, it was always take the riskier path. Um, the other thing which is kind of interesting is that for our family, when someone said no, that was more the cue that it was time to try and figure out some way to work around this. So I've kind of never been a person who takes a no for an answer. Yeah, I read that you're big into pitching. Like you would pitch your mom, <laughs> you obviously pitch read your, your co-founder. Like what makes a good pitch to investors, to anyone, to influence them to buy into you as a, as a person or your business idea? Well, actually in the book I talk about, not explicitly about pitching, but about asking. Um, and the story that I tell in the book, of course, is the, that I learned so much about pitching or asking was uh, I was uh, leading these trips for urban youth. Um, they were outdoors trips. We'd take kids from the inner city, bring them out into the wilderness where they're totally disoriented. And so someone had the great idea that the staff should have an experience equally disorienting. Um, and so they dropped us off in the streets of Hartford with no money, no wallet, no ID, no watch, nothing. And said, so we'll pick you up in three days. And you get hungry. And so I decided, well, I, at first I began stealing food by swooping in after someone gets up at the food court. And then I go, I'm cutting out the middleman, and I began panhandling. And what you learn when you ask for money, which is the naked ask, give me something, nothing in return, is eventually the way to do it is to be honest and to be vulnerable and reveal with your voice and your words and your body what you're looking for. Um, and in that case, it was I'm hungry. Uh, but when you're looking for money, when you're raising money in a pitch, it's really letting people know that this is not BS. I believe in this. And Here's where I think I'm vulnerable. Here's where I think we're strong. And people see those things. But the ultimate skill, and this is not learned in the streets of Hartford, is empathy. Mm. You have to understand in advance how what you're saying is gonna be perceived by somebody. How whether the offer you're making is gonna impact that person. Because as trite as it is and as oft repeated, the win-win is so much more powerful than the I'm stronger than you are and so you're gonna do what I say. Yeah, that's a really good point. Early in my career, a lot of people said that will never work, or they laughed at me when I wanted to write a book. So I dealt with cyberbullying, in-person bullying. People just didn't believe in me or the idea early on. Right. What does it take to overcome that and continue to follow the path that aligns to your dreams and goals? Well, I think anybody who's ever had an idea has had that exact same thing that you and I've had. You know, if you wake up oh, you've got this great idea and you can't wait to tell someone. And you come rushing down and you tell your wife or you tell your, your kids, you come to work and tell your coworkers. And you're right, they all say the same thing, uh, which is that'll never work. And then they helpfully tell you all the reasons you're so stupid. Um, but my favorite saying is actually, uh, comes from a guy named William Goldman, who's a screenwriter. But he wrote, uh, nobody knows anything talking about Hollywood and how no one knows if a movie is going to be successful until after it's launched. And every idea is like that. Really, no one knows. So to answer the question as a long preamble, you have to eventually realize they have no idea. This so-called expert, they have no idea whether it's going to work or not. The only way to find out whether it's going to work, the only way to know if my book is going to be good, the only way to know if the article is going to resonate, the only way I know whether it's going to get accepted is to write it, try it, pitch it, and see what happens. Yeah, it's like action is your compass of, to figuring out what your path is. You don't know what you like or don't like unless you actually try. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, in, in the book, we, this, this really is that guide. It's a story about launching and building Netflix, but it also in some ways is the kind of the, dream, the guide to following your dreams. And that is the fundamental thing, is you have to start. You've got to stop thinking and start doing. Because the idea is just an idea. It's wrong. 
whatever the idea is, I guarantee it's wrong. You just don't know how it's wrong. You don't know which bit of that wrongness has a glimmer of hope until you actually collide it with the, with the reality. Yeah, and different from Reed, your business partner, you've kind of been a little behind the scenes. I know you've been in the public you know, circuit scenes speaking to big audiences, but it takes a certain level of humility to take a step back and not constantly be out there like your business partner. And so just tell me about that and your view of fame and fortunes and su success in your role. Um, you know, it's really a very common question. You know, it's like, are you bitter? Or, you know, you, you gave up stock. And, it, and I, I, this is going to sound silly, I don't get it sometimes. Because I consider myself so unbelievably lucky. Because first of all, I was never in this for the money. I was in it because I just love solving really hard problems. And I had this dream of starting a company that sold stuff on the internet. And I got to see my dream come true, which is, that's the most unbelievably fulfilling thing. And the company went public. And so I did fine. And now I get a chance to work with other early stage entrepreneurs. And I got a chance to spend time with my family. My kids know me and that's just like, like, like me. That was me knocking on wood if you're just listening. Um, how could I possibly resent uh, what's happened other than that or who was in the front? I mean, there was a point, and this is about early, less than a year in, where Reed Hastings was, I was CEO, I was running the company, I started it. Reed Hastings was the biggest investor, um, was the chair of our board, uh, or our three-person board. Um, and he knocked on the door one night and put his head in and said, you know, we need to talk. Which is at the point you kind of go, uh-oh, <laughs> something's up. And, and he delivered the news that he was losing confidence in me, um, that he was seeing things at the small size that gave him concern, not for now, but for later. And he, we both wanted there to be a later. And it made me kind of come to grips with the fact that this dream of running the successful company was really two dreams. There was a dream of running it and the dream of the successful company and that I was recognizing that fundamentally I had a pick. Because what Reed was saying was not, you're out. He was saying, we should run this together. That together, we have a much better chance of making it successful. And how could I argue with that? Because he was absolutely right. And I mean, this is not easy. I went home that night and sat with my wife and we had a bunch of glasses of wine. And ultimately, I decided that the more important thing for me was making the company successful and that my role in it was secondary. And it turned out by Reed and I doing it together, it was so great. In many ways, that was the renaissance for Netflix. That's where so many of the innovations that took us from being a lame, DVD with late fees and you know due dates turned it into this platform which set the stage for what it's become now. How did your strengths offset each other's weaknesses? And when did you realize that? I almost immediately Reed, you know, Reed acquired one of the startup startup that I had done with some friends and I went to work with him. And more importantly, we lived in the same town I did, so we began commuting back and forth. So I had a lot of exposure to him both personally and professionally. And the thing you notice right away is the directness. And that's me too. And Reed and I immediately recognized we could be brutally honest with each other without it being um, emotionally damaging. It wasn't like we were being mad. We were just being honest. And that is such a refreshing relationship to have with anybody. Um, and I immediately knew this is a guy that I would love to do something with. And in addition to the communication style, we came from different worlds. I mean, I was a marketing guy. I was in direct marketing. I was all about customer relations. I was all about marketing and empathy. I was all about that piece of it, product. He was all about operations and finance, computer science, math. And when you think about what the internet is, it's this combination of those two things. And when you put two people together who have those two skill sets, really powerful. Yeah, and everyone knows the story of Blockbuster. They really missed the boat, I think you could say, right? But what can be learned about that? Because disruption is one of the biggest buzzwords in every industry right now. And Netflix, of course, can be disrupted as well. Every company can. Uh, how, do you not, how do you not let another company disrupt you and stay ahead of the curve? Yeah, I firmly believe that the only way to avoid being disrupted is to learn how to disrupt yourself, if you're a large company. 
Um, it's inevitable. And most companies get taken down not because someone's coming after them doing something they already do well. They get taken down because someone comes after them doing a thing which they can't do, but more likely a thing they're scared to do or unwilling to do or it's uncomfortable to do. And they're unwilling or uncomfortable because this thing that someone's coming after them would require them to take a step backwards. Because you, you, let's just take a simple example. Someone is a big manufacturing company which sells through multiple stage distribution, meaning it sells into distributors who then sell to retail stores who sell to customers. And of course, it's a markup at each stage of that. And then someone comes along and begins selling direct, competing with them, going straight from manufacturing to consumer. And the big company sees it and they go, it's happening. Well, we've got to begin selling direct. Whoa, 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 says the $350,000 a year senior sales guy. Oh, no, you don't, says the distributor who's doing 98% of their business. Oh, whoa, 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 we're going to stop carrying this, say all the retail stores. And so what do they do? Well, we'll figure it. We'll, they're tiny. We'll deal with them later. And little by little, they let that company get a foothold. And then all of a sudden, you have the guys saying, we'll try and buy you for $50 million. Not a chance. And that's how you end up with those things. It, if you're a startup, oh my God, this is awesome. You can go after anybody and they're not going to respond. Now, if you're a big company, it's terrifying because the person coming after you is not going to look anything like you and they may not even be in business yet. So it's an interesting <laughs> world. One of the things I study is corporate culture. Right. And one of the examples I always use is Netflix, the culture deck. And your Netflix is known as, as, as having the best maternal paternal leave program, I think, in the world. So talk about the corporate culture when you were in it and how it's evolved and what you, what you think makes a good corporate culture. So the first observation I would make about culture is culture is not what you say. It is not what you write down. It's not your deck. It's not what you carve in the corners of your building. It's what you do. And as any kid learns very quickly, what's more important is how the parents act, not what the parents say. And it's exactly the same in a company. So culture springs from how the founders treat each other, how they treat their company, how they talk to their customers. That is culture. A culture deck, if it's a good one, purely codifies what's already in place. So that's the first thing that makes a strong culture. It has to reflect reality. Companies can all have different cultures. The Netflix culture is very unique because they, they, we, Reed and I, and Patty McCord, and Mitch Lowe, and Christina Kish, and T. Smith, and all the people who were there, those first 20 to 30 people, we recognize early on that we cannot be telling each other, here's what you have to do, and I'm going to check in with you at the end of the day, and you're going to write a status report. No time. You go, well, here's what you have to be in a month. I trust you to take the responsibility to be there. And I'm giving you the freedom to figure out how to do it. And most companies start out like that. What's different about Netflix is it's figured out how to scale that freedom and responsibility. And it's really hard. Now, I'm gonna, okay, I'll keep rambling here for a second. This is such a good subject. We could do a whole another I know. five questions on culture. But the fundamental piece about this Netflix one is that They've recognized that most companies realize that people don't have good judgment sometimes. And so they build guardrails to prevent those employees from doing damage. And by putting those guardrails in place, it takes all the people who have great judgment and drives them nuts, and they leave. And so they go, aha, see? We need the guardrails even more, because the people who are left. And Netflix went the opposite way. It goes, what happens if you remove the guardrails? You begin to attract and retain people with great judgment who love the fact they're given the freedom and responsibility. But the hard part is when you find someone in the company who doesn't have good judgment, you can't leave them there. And that requires saying goodbye a lot. And that's hard. And what's your best piece of career advice? Um, start and do anything you can which is even tangentially related to what um, you want. But actually, here it is boiled down in just a handful of words. My advice, and this is advice for people who are starting out. Actually, I take that back. Anyone who's thinking about getting into something new, 
Number one, find the smartest person you know that will take you seriously and do anything they want. Great. Simple as that. <laughs> no strings attached. No. They say, sweep the floor. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, by being there, you will see. You'll see how they do their job. You'll see how the industry works. You'll see how all the moving pieces. And if you are an amazing sweeper, when they're looking around going, where's the person who's going to now run this small little thing? They're going to pick a person they know is responsible and hardworking rather than taking a chance at an outsider. And then all of a sudden that moves, you do that job as best you can, whatever it is. No one, don't go, wait, I've got, I have a degree and I should be doing this. Yeah, bullshit. Get out of here. I'll find someone who's willing to do it. So that's my, that's my career advice. I'll see how many people take it. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Real pleasure to. <laughs>